the privilege of preaching here this morning. I'm married to a beautiful lady called Fiona. We've got two little munchkins called Olivia and Benjamin. And what's more is that we as a Life Changes Church, we planted Life Changes City last week, Sunday night. Come on. Yeah. Very exciting. There will be a few photos that will just flick behind me from the launch if you weren't able to be there. It was an incredible night. The venue was packed. We, we worshiped God in, in extravagance. We, uh, we just saw God honor. We honored a whole bunch of people. Um, the Word of God was preached. Pe- visitors were connected. We just saw a lot of life of God happening in this launch. Uh, what is the best news of all was people responded to the gospel and uh, people returned to their faith as well. It's so exciting to see what God is doing already in the city. Um, take a sip of water. Ah, talking about the city is thirst, thirsty work, I tell you. But here's our appeal. If you are part of Life Changes Church and you are saying, I, I would love to, I'd love to see this con- congregation, why don't you come join us? One of the next few Sunday nights, it takes place 5 p.m. in the city. It's an Andrews Presbyterian Church. All the details are on our website. But come visit, come be a part of it. Every now and again, just pop in because this is not for a select few people. This is not somebody else's church. This is our church. This is a life changes church. And why don't you come and add life and faith, especially in the initial weeks, to the team who are pioneering and planting there. It'll be really great to host you. But for you to come and, and worship with us and add life to what God is building in the city. It's amazing to see what God is doing, but I believe He's only just getting started. Really good to see you this morning. Uh, just before we get preaching this morning, I've been uh, this, this week just so astounded by uh, something in the Word where uh, God was, uh, there's this principle in the Bible of something called the tabernacle. In the first half of the Bible, in the Old Testament, this was the, pl- or the place where God would meet His people. And the, the tabernacle was, where it would house the, the presence of God and it was set up in the, in the very center of the dwellings of the people. And God put this principle in place that if you were to come and encounter His presence and you came in through the north gate, once you'd encountered His presence, you had to leave through the south gate. If you came likewise to the east gate and encountered His presence, you'll then have to leave through the west gate. The whole premise behind this principle was that the people of God could not leave the same way that they came into the presence of God. I want to say this morning how much more for us of a new covenant disposition disposition, who know the presence of God, not that doesn't live in a box, but lives within us. How much more for us? And I want to say to you, you and I, when we encounter the presence of God, we cannot leave the same way we came in. That's good preaching already. Thank you so much to the two of you. Uh, I mean, we should just sit down right now. No, I want to say that clearly this morning, that I really believe that you, sir, ma'am, if you encounter the presence of God with faith this morning, you will not leave the same way you came. If you came in here with the guilt and shame, you can leave here forgiven and free. If you came in with depression, you can leave here with joy in your heart. If you came here sick, you can leave with healing. Come on, yeah. Now we're talking. Let's get the keyboard and stuff. Where's Impele? Come on. I really believe this morning that actually you can leave different from the way you walked in here. I really believe it. So if you believe that this morning and you have that echoing in your heart, why don't you turn to your neighbor right now and tell them, I'm not leaving the same way I came. Come on, do it, do it, do it. If you've got another neighbor, tell them as well. Tell them as well. We are in a series, a few week series, where we briefly, as a vi- part of our vision series, looking at the one line of Scripture, John 10 verse 10, and it reads in the NIV behind me like this. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came so that they may have life and life to the abundance. There's two understandings here. We have to firstly understand the first line tells us that there is an enemy. We have an enemy, sir, ma'am. The thief, the liar, Satan. He is our enemy and his job description, his mandate is not to make your life uncomfortable, not to make your life tricky, not just to make you a little bit stressed out at times. His job is to steal, kill, and destroy the life of God in you. He wants to rip everything away that is good and pleasing and pleasant and and pull you away from relationship with him, with the Father. The enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy you. Welcome to Sunday. But it's something we need to know. Something we need to know, especially in our Western church, who think that everything is just just up to us and in our control. We have an enemy that is hell-bent, excuse the pun, against us. But, oh, don't you love that word, but, in that scripture? The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But, 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 Jesus says, it's a good shepherd. I came that they may have life and life to the full or life in abundance. This is what's on offer. We have a thief who wants to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. But we have a good shepherd, a savior named Jesus, who wants to usher you into abundant life. 
And that abundant life is not reserved for a select few. It's not reserved for the religious elite, for those who have a badge on their chest. That abundant life is open to all who would hear His voice this morning. And I'm praying, I'm praying that you and I would hear His voice echoing, resounding into our hearts today as He pulls us out of apathy, as He pulls us out of neutrality, as He pulls us out of our lukewarm ability, and we'll respond not just to the voice of the enemy, but the voice of the Good Shepherd who has abundant life for us. Don't settle, sir, ma'am. We're off and running this morning. We're going to preach this morning briefly from a, well, I'll try. Genesis chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, why don't you turn there? Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. We're going back to the beginning, back to our roots. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 to 15. It'll be on the screen behind me, but I like seeing it in the black and white text. It says this, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the blood yield, no longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you'll be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, my punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, no, for I'll give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let's pray this morning. Father, my prayer is one filled with faith and simplicity at the same time. Would you silence the voice of the accuser? Would you silence the voice of the enemy? in every single life here this morning? And would you reveal to every heart the abundant life that you have on offer for every single one of us? Do this in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. Let me give you a little bit of a background to this very, if be honest, bizarre story in Genesis chapter 4. The background starts off actually, uh, this is profound. You might not want to write this one down. Are you ready for some deep theology? Genesis 4 takes place after Genesis 3. Yeah, drop the mic right there. Tweet that one. Why that is significant, though, is Genesis 3 actually is the account of something that is colloquially or even theologically named the fall. The fall, the moment where humanity that in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 was, for the lack of a better word, given abundant life, life on planet Earth. They were given all of creation and told to have dominion over it. Nothing was withheld from them. Uh, and, and God said it was also not just abundant life at that level, but abundant life with Him where they were made to walk in the cool of the day with God Almighty, face to face, knowing His presence, knowing His delight. They were given abundant life on a platter. But Genesis 3 comes and we introduce to the, the enemy, the thief, the liar, who comes and seduces them away from that abundant life and, say, and suggests that God somehow is holding out on them. And Eve, we know that if you know some of the story, she reaches out, she takes the fruit and sets into motion a whole lot of events that, that, are the, that put the, plunge the human, human race into a sinful state, a depraved state, into darkness. And Eve, in her despair, and Adam, they go and they hide because they're naked and ashamed. And it seems like the enemy has already run, won a, a victory already. But God arrives on the scene, and He speaks to some words, paraphrasing very quickly, to the enemy, the serpent at this time, and says to the enemy, you think you may have won the victory today, but I want to tell you the battle rests with me. He says, in this moment, you've won the victory against Adam and Eve, but from Eve, from her womb, shall come a seed. A seed will be born from her womb that will crush your head. 
And a promise was put in place in amongst their mess, in amongst their brokenness and depravity and their, 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 their sin. A promise shone forth through, and hope started to stir and flicker and kindle into light in Adam and Eve's hearts. Picks it up in Genesis chapter 4, where they give birth to Cain and Abel, two sons. Cain, who we learn is a farmer, a man who works the soil, in, involved in agriculture, and Abel, a man who keep of the sheep. And, uh, and this, these two sons, I can imagine even Adam would have thought, maybe this will be the seed from a womb, the promise. One generation, just then one generation will be able to put right what was made wrong in the garden. Because a seed was, was, was born to them. But as we read that narrative, you realize that actually uh, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of rubbish going on behind the scenes here and, and humans' hearts warring. And, and many questions can arise. You can start to wonder what's going on because Cain comes to God and he brings him, uh, for the lack of a better word, a vegetable platter. Yeah. And uh, from, from, the, from the works of his efforts and his labors, he brings some produce. And Abel comes and brings a lamb that he kills, his firstborn lamb, kills it and brings it and presents that as a sacrifice to God. Now, there's so many questions you could have, and theologically, we can go down different tracks. What is going on in this moment? Uh, one thought could be that this is make, lays it very clear that God is not a vegan. <laughs> it's just a joke. Relax, everyone. Relax, relax, relax. Hold on to your hummus, everyone. Hold on. But actually, but actually, what's going on here is not a type of, hey, what type of sacrifice does God want? Is this one? And, and what was going on in Cain's heart? And what is in Abel's heart? And we start to surmise, what was their motives? No, I, I believe that actually at, at the very base level, what God is doing is He's setting a precedent in motion that will last the rest of Scripture. That will go from, from chapter 3 all the way to the very uh, book end of the book in Revelation 22, where the, actually, the fact is that actually man's efforts and man's sweat and man's produce will, will never be enough to satisfy God. And what's more and what's greater still, that the only thing that will satisfy God, the only thing that will give Him His life will be a sacrifice of blood. Now, stick with me, a firstborn lamb. You see, this is where we come into, I've got two points that I want to help us navigate the story with today. And the first one is this, grace versus striving. Grace versus striving. Or better put, in a more unpalatable way, the question the enemy will ask you again and again, have you done enough? Have you done enough, sir, man? A great theologian once wrote this line. He said, the greatest temptation in life is to think it is by further, better, and more aggressive living that we can find life. And I think that's what the enemy does to us. The enemy comes to steal, kill, destroy. The Jesus comes to bring life and life in abundance, but our human brain thinks to get life and life in abundance means that we have to work hard to get there. And the enemy puts us, uh, in, a, for, in a picture's sake, he puts us on a hamster wheel, an eternal hamster wheel, or, or for, you, for you exercise junkies, a treadmill that just seems to be going quicker and quicker. And you're running and you're running, and you're working harder and harder, and you're trying to please God, you're trying to not look at this thing, you're trying to do that thing, you're trying to tick all the boxes, and you feel like you're running and running, but you're not going anywhere, you're still struggling with the same temptation, you're struggling with the same moments, you're still in the dip of depression, you can't move forward, and you're wondering why, because you're sweating hard, but you're not moving anywhere. And the enemy is saying, have you done enough? The perpetual question will always be asked. You see, this is what is amazing about the story. The son named Cain, that name Cain means two things. It means produced or acquired. The name Cain, the one who tilled the soil and brought the crops forth to God, his name means produced or acquired. Somebody who worked hard by the sweat of his brow. Abel, his name is brother. His name means breath or nothing. That's what scholars say. Scholars say his name Abel means breath or nothing. I love that for a Saturday afternoon. I don't know about you. Breath and nothing. What a great Saturday afternoon. Impossible with toddlers. But anyway, I digress. You see, in this story, we realize that God, as I said, is putting in place a precedent that there'll only be one thing that'll suffice, and that is the blood of a lamb. Now, let me tell you this as a, as a, as a headline. The blood of the lamb is always enough, sir, man. The blood of the lamb is always enough. The best way that I can illustrate this and understand this is that every page of the Bible, every story in the Bible is not actually putting forth a greater level of morality for something you and I to live up to. Every page, every parenthesis at its core is shouting out one message. The blood is enough. The blood is enough. You see, Genesis 4, we flick a few pages. Genesis 22, we stumble over a story about a man named Abraham. 
And Abraham, when he meets God, is barren, and his wife and he can't have kids. They're very old. And God speaks to him and says, listen, from, your, from you, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And they, 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 by the natural senses, they can't make it happen. God makes it happen. Isaac is born there, uh, the supernaturally, the son of promise in their a- old age. And I can imagine as Abraham and Sarah probably would have gone, this is it, this is the start. And they would have sat down and worked out, okay, if Isaac marries her, who's got the, which family's got the best genes that are going to produce lots of children so we can have, we got to do this fast because we're going to make this thing happen. Isaac has got to lead to multiple generations. God's promised it, but we're going to make it happen. We're going to make this promise and produce it into something amazing. But God has always said it's not through your sweat. It's not through your production. It's not through your acquiring that you'll move forward. Abundant life is in him alone. So God says to him, Isaac, I need you to take your son, your only son, Isaac. I want you to take him up a mountain, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Now, I don't know about you, but on first reading, I go, what is God on about? Is God on about if infanticide? Is he, is he now about to, telling us to kill our children? What, what is the moral here? Try search for a moral, you'll come up with none. But why? Because God's not on about trying to get us at base level, trying to make, uh, raise us a little bit higher than our dirt. He's trying to give us a view of eternity and showing us what is He doing. Because at the very crux of the moment, Abraham comes, lays his only son on the altar. And he understands, he said, God, I know that you promised me that through me that I'll be a father of many nations. And right now it looks like in my logic I'm putting to death the only hope for that. But God, I trust you that if I kill him, you'll raise him to life and that you'll make your promise happen because you're the keeper of the promise, not me. And Abraham lifts up his knife and he's about to kill his only son. And just at that moment, God's voice echoes out saying, Abraham, stop. So he stops and says, Abraham, in the thicket there's a ram, a lamb that I need you to go and fetch. It's caught in the thicket. You must fetch it, take Isaac off the altar, put that, that lamb on the altar, and sacrifice that lamb to me instead. And it's the first picture we get of substitution where one man is substituted for one lamb. You keep re- reading the story, you get to Exodus chapter 12. And if you follow the narrative, the people of Israel have gone into, uh, into G- Egypt and they're now in captivity for 400 years. 400 years where they have been defined, in essence, by the life of Cain, where their life was all about production and acquiring where they were defined by the sweat of their brow. They worked for a a hard taskmaster, Pharaoh, who was never satisfied, who had them on a perpetual treadmill and saying, work more, be more, consume more, work more, be more, do more. And they had to keep producing brick after brick with no relenting, no remorse. And it just felt like a whole lot of work and effort and not moving forward. And then told, so one day, a deliverer is coming. A deliverer is coming. He's going to lead you out of Egypt. And I can imagine in their heads, they start to work out, actually, we're looking a lot more muscular than those, those Egyptians up in the palace. If the deliverer just comes and mobilizes us, if we get into formation and rank and file, we'll be able to plunder the, 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 the palaces and, and the, the, the pharaohs and take all the, the, the treasures and we'll be able to rip them into shreds because look at us, we've been prepared for this moment. But God says, no, 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 you're not going to deliver yourself. I'm going to deliver you. It's not through your produce. It's not going to be through your work and your sweat. It's going to be through me. So in Exodus chapter 12, it comes to a head where, where Moses tells him, says, actually, on this night, you're going to see the deliverance of your God. And he says, in this moment, tonight, what's going to happen is every family is going to take the lamb, the firstborn lamb, slaughter it, take the blood of that lamb, and paint their door frames with that blood. And when you do that, the angel of the Lord will pass over every home in the valley. And every home that does not have the blood of a lamb on his doorposts, the firstborn male will be killed. And again, I read that story, and I'm like, God, what are you on about? And God's saying, no, I'm driving at something deeper. I'm driving at something deeper than what first meets the eye. And I can imagine this for the Israelites. They probably would have said, Moses, we've seen the mighty hand of God through the plagues. Are you sure that that is all God says that will stop his hand of wrath over us? The blood on our door, is that all? Surely there's something else we must do, a prayer we must pray, a a liturgy that we must sing, a dance we must do, an offering we must bring. No, something. What else is there for us to do, Moses? Tell us. We want to make sure. I want to protect our family. And Moses says, I've only just been given the blood. Put the blood. So family after family, put the blood on their doors and wait. And I think a picture it. Imagine myself at home with Fiona, Olivia, and Benjamin. And we sing at home, and we put blood on the door, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. And down our street, just here around the corner, we start to hear in the evening a scream as, ah! A firstborn son is killed in a home that doesn't have the blood on their door. 
And we just hear screams coming up the street. And I started to hold on to my family, holding on to them, saying, please, surely I pray, God, will that be enough? Will the blood be enough? Will the blood be enough? Have I done enough? Start thinking through things I should have done, could have done, would have done. And I go, surely, I, I, it's too late now. Is that enough for me? Is that enough for me? Holding on to my family for dear life. And I feel the whisper of death come over our home and then pass on over, leaving us untouched. That's what happened in the book of Exodus. As the blood of the lamb was enough to stay the hand of a wrathful God. You see, we see in Genesis 22, one lamb for one man. Exodus 12, for one lamb for one family. In the book of Leviticus, we see as the nation of Israel set free, they get given this, this principle from God that every once a year, the whole nation will gather in assembly and to atone for their sins and their guilt, they'll bring, you guessed it, one lamb to the high priest. And they'll give the, uh, the lamb to the high priest, unblemished, the firstborn, and the, the priest would lay his hands on that lamb and impute all the sins of the people into that lamb and then slaughter it. You see what would happen year after year, the people's guilt would be assuaged, would be put aside. Why? Because the blood of the lamb was enough. You see Genesis 22, one lamb for one man. Exodus 12, one lamb for one family. Book of Leviticus, one lamb for one nation. And then we get to the book of John, John chapter 1. The nation, the people of Israel again are in some form of captivity. This time under a Roman rule, an oppressing rule who's pushing them and, and, and pressing them down and got them on the treadmill again. And they're waiting again for a Messiah who will come, the promised Messiah who will lead us into freedom. And they've got pictures, and I can imagine dreams of a Messiah who would come and lead a revolt. They would take on Jerusalem, and then would take on Rome, and pull down the political powers of the day. And they would rule and reign in Rome, and lead with power. The Messiah will come and put us into glory. But John knows something that the people did not know. That actually God is not pleased or not moved by the produce or sweat or acumen of man. He is moved only by the blood of the Lamb. You see, John looks out in John chapter 1, and he sees Jesus coming out of the wilderness, and John says, to, says about Jesus, the first time anything is spoken about Jesus by another man in, in, this, in this way, John says this, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Genesis 22, one lamb for one man. Exodus 12, one lamb for one family. Leviticus, one lamb for one nation. In John, we introduce to the one lamb for the entire world. The blood of the lamb is always enough. We go back to our story in Genesis 4, and God says to Cain, after Cain has killed his brother in, in vengeful anger, God says to him, what have you done? What have you done, Cain? And he says, Cain, the blood of your, your brother cries out to me. Your blood of the brother cries out for vengeance. But I want to tell you, if you keep reading the story of the Bible, in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, we introduced this fact, it says this, the, that the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. When Abel's blood cried out for vengeance, when Jesus died and his blood was shed, that blood cries out for forgiveness. That blood, blood cries out and speaks a better word for mercy. That blood cries out and speaks a better word for grace and forgiveness and love. This is the blood of Jesus. And I want to tell you today, sir and ma'am, that when the enemy comes and whispers in your ear, and he will come and whisper in your ear, when he says this to you and he accuses you and says, have, you could have done more for your kids. And you look back with regret and he says, you could have done more. You could have done more. It plagues you night after night. And he says this word in your ear. He says, if only you could have been there, you would have avoided X, Y, and Z. If only you had been present in that moment. And he'll accuse you again. He'll say, you don't deserve an abundant marriage because of what you did. You don't, what you, ha what you have done or haven't done. He says, you don't deserve an abundant future. You don't deserve an abundant relationship with God. When the enemy comes and whispers that word in your ear, night and day, trying to get you on the treadmill to work harder, to atone for your guilt and your shame, to move more, I want to tell you, sir, ma'am, you have to remember this, remember this, remember this, remember this. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the voice of the accuser. The blood of Jesus speaks and shouts mercy and grace and forgiveness over our hearts. You see, this is so huge for you and I because Billy Graham said this amazing thing. He said, if I had my life to live again, I would, I would they said, I interviewed him. What would you do, Billy? He said, if I had my life to live again, I would only preach the blood of Jesus and the finished work of the cross for in that is the true power of the gospel. That is where the power of God is. You see, this is so huge because where Jesus lived, he, he performed miracles, outstanding miracles that grabbed the attention of a nation. 
And he, he taught incredible sermons. Sermons are still being quoted and recited world over by, by believers and atheists and, and non-believers alike. The Jesus' sermons still stand as these incredible texts to study. But as great as his miracles were and as great as his teachings were, none of those tore the veil in the temple. He performed miracle after miracle, but the veil still stood. The veil that separated God from man still stood erected. He did incredible teachings and exhorted the people and told amazing parables that astounded many. But with every sermon, the veil in the temple still stood. It was only when he died and his blood was shed that that veil was ripped asunder from top to bottom, never be to be stitched up again. And the way to God has been made open. It's only by the blood of Jesus. This is so huge for you and I. And we get a sense of warning in the, in the, the book of Jude, a, a New Testament prophet. Jude writes this one line. He says, beware the way of Cain. And what is he saying here? He's not putting a moralistic principle. Beware the way of Cain. Don't kill your brother. Although that's a good principle. It's a good one. Write that one down. Helpful. But what he's getting at, again, is a deeper level. He says, beware the way of thinking that what you produce, what you acquire, your sweat, your energies, your efforts will get you in and nearer to God than you think you can. Beware the way of Cain. Don't fall to pray to that, that, that treadmill, that hamster wheel. Because you see, in this moment, I want to remind us, it's not a righteousness required, it's a righteousness supplied. It's not a righteousness required. He's not holding, saying, he has a standard, will you meet it? He says, I've met the standard, that I've supplied it. Come on in with boldness and confidence. Get off the treadmill and run into abundant life. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Point two and the final point this morning Grace versus striving. Secondly, grace versus sin. If grace versus striving is have I done enough, grace versus sin is have I done too much. Maybe this is the question that plagues your soul. It plagues, I think, everyone in humanity's soul at some level and moment in their life. Have I done, have I done too much? The guilt, the, the replays of that sin, that habitual sin that you promised many times you would not revisit that promise that you said you'll keep, that, that word that you said in anger, that sent, an emotion, sent into motion events that you cannot pull back into your family, things that you wish you could go back and, and undo and redo, and, and you don't know how to go back and go over it. Those sort of moments that hold us captive. And I think so often as a church, we find it very easy to sing amazing grace, but we feel it, find it very hard to live amazing grace. We feel it very easy to sing amazing grace, but we feel it hard to walk into abundant life. We think, yes, I know I am saved. I know I've got heaven, but abundant life, I think I'm disqualified from that. I've made too many mistakes for my marriage to get whole into that. I've made too many errors to get my finances, my emotions, my, my relationships into line, into abundant life that God's got for me. And we believe the lie of the enemy. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. We have to understand something powerful here. You see, what is so huge in this is there's a scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. The antithesis of a heart that says, have I done too much, is this scripture right here. It declares in the NIV, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, ooh, I love that word, anyone. Is there an anyone over here? An anyone, can I see your hand? Any anyone's? I see the anyone's. Good, nice to see. Right, loud and proud. I'm an anyone. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new has come. Let me tell you why this is so powerful. The author there, the writer to the, book of, to the church in Corinthians, Paul, could have used the word when he said new. He could have used the word neos. That word neos literally translated means upgrade. He could have said the old is gone, the upgrade has come. And we as a people know upgrades. Are we not, we are quite familiar with upgrades, you know? iPhone 10, iPhone 11. Same, same, but different. And more expensive. We know it. We know upgrades. I, I tend to I-20 of a Hyundai variety. We know upgrades. Economy class to business class. And, and, and beef or chicken, beef, chicken, or salmon. Ooh, wow. <laughs> I've never experienced that myself, but one day we live in hope. <laughs> we know upgrades. We've got an understanding of it. It's the same, but a little bit better. Same, a little bit better. And I think sometimes we apply it. We think that's what he was meaning. We think the old is gone and the upgrade has come. Gabe 2.0. Yes, I am saved, but actually I'm still the same Gabe. He still struggles with the same sins, still struggles with the same addiction, still struggles with the same tendencies, still st struggles with the same infallibility, the fallibilities. I'm still the same Gabe, basically. But I'm just a little bit better. 
And we think we just moved on a little bit and we just need to better ourselves a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And that's what religion and the enemy will sell us again and again. The upgrade, you've got to just keep upgrading. Have you upgraded your software? Have you updated it? No, oh, and, check, and, and we live in perpetual nervousness. But that's not what the word he uses. He doesn't use, the old is gone, the neos has come. He uses the word kairos. Now kairos here, yeah, new, is, means this at the very essence of it. Brand spanking, never seen before, new. So he says, the old is gone. The brand spanking never seen before new has come. Meaning the old Gabe has died and done away with. And the new has come. The new life has come that is found only in Christ. Let's keep going. Let's keep going in this journey here. That word kairos, if you keep understanding it, doesn't only just mean that. It means appointed or promised. Why don't you say it with me? Say appointed. appointed. Come on and say promised. promised. I think we've got to say it one more time. Say appointed. Promised. Oh, this is getting good. Hold those words. Put a pin in there for a second. You see, we go back to Genesis chapter 4, and we find that things have spiraled out of control. From the garden, one chapter later, from, from bliss to now, it's, a, it's just a bombshell everywhere. There's mess everywhere. If you've watched Days of Our Lives or Grey's Anatomy, they've got nothing on the Bible. It's just chaos. It spiraled out of control from Eve to Cain, and then Cain, six generations later, sin upon sin is now spiraled out of control. Murder is not just something that once happened. It happens regularly on a regular interval. It has become the way of his family to find who they are, and sin is abounding so much so we get to, uh, to Cain's great, great, great grandson, Lamech, who gets a brief little moment in Scripture and to highlight the depravity of his sin and what has happened from Cain to Lamech, the, 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 the very essence of have I done too much is found in this family. Because Lamech makes this one phrase. He says when he, is, he just murders two people and he utters out this triumphal speaking. He doesn't feel any guilt or remorse. He said, if, if my forefather Cain got vengeance seven times by doing his sin, let my vengeance be seven times, 70 times. So he just says, my sin and my vengeance will be much more than my brother, my, my great, 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 great grandfather. He says, sin has just taken so such root, it's now exploding into playways we'd never even imagine. But what is so profound is if you know your scriptures, you'll read when Jesus has an encounter with a man named Peter. Peter comes to you and says, Jesus, there's these people who are frustrating and antagonizing me, and, and I want to know, how many times do I need to forgive them until I can bring vengeance? And Jesus says this. He says, you need to forgive them 70 times, seven times. Ooh, did Jesus just make up a number? Mm, that sounds a lot. Let's see how long, how much they do that. No, no, no. This is the only second time it appears in Scripture. Genesis 4, it's spoken about the depravity of Lamech's sin, saying, I'll have vengeance 70 times to, se to the power of seven. Jesus says, you're going to forgive 70 times seven. Jesus is saying, where your, your sin deserves punishment, he says, my, my love for you, my blood deserves, pours out forgiveness like you would never imagine. This is the good news of the gospel if we keep leaning in, that we understand that if we see Eve's sin is actually rewritten and made new in the hands of a merciful God. Her sin and her failure rewritten. Why? How do we know this? Is this amazing moment if we keep reading in Genesis 4. She has this hope from me, a seed will come, they'll crush the enemy. Cain and Abel. Abel's dead. Cain's gone off to a foreign land. The descendants are in, 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 in me at mess and chaos. But in chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4, we have this incredible line. It says, Adam had sexual relations with Eve, and they fell pregnant with a son named Seth. Now, what is so cool about that? Cain's name means produced or acquired. Abel's name means breath or nothing. Seth's name means appointed or promised. The old is gone. The appointed or promised has come. What is so huge, if you keep reading, Genesis chapter 5 will be on the screen behind me. Genesis chapter 5, God starts to rewrite Eve's mess and Eve's betrayal and Eve's destruction. It says this, this is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. Let's just pause quickly. The first line, this is the written account of Adam's family line. No, it's not. Correctly, it should be Adam's line should, was, started, was already written. Cain and Abel. But God's saying, no, no, no. The old is gone, the new has come. I'm rewriting a story here. It said, this is the written account. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them mankind when they were created. Where have I heard that before? Genesis 1. It's like he's taking them back to the start, recreating life itself in their line. And he says this, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness. In his own image, he named him Seth. 
appointed and promised. Seth, let's remember that. Last scripture for the day, Luke chapter 3. Oh, I love me a genealogy. Come on. Hmm, good stuff in there. Luke chapter 3 says this. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so restored of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mephat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Mephathiah, the son of Amos. I think we get the picture. Let's go to the next one. The son of Joshua, the son of Elysia, the son of Joram, the son of Mephat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon. What time do you guys need to be home? Just joking. Let's keep going. The son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonah, the son of Eliakim. Let's keep going. Next one. The son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Surug, the son of Ru, I feel like a rapper. The son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Kainan, the son of uh, whatever that one is. The son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth. Son of Adam, the son of God. From your seed shall come one that crushes the head of the enemy. Jesus' line was traced to the son of promise and appointment, Seth. Not the son of produce and acquire and sweat. Not even able, breath and nothing. He said, it's only through my doing, only through what I can do will your victory come through. This is so huge because I can imagine the enemy who was present in the garden, he hears that prophecy, your head will be crushed by a seed of this woman. So he waits and as Genesis 4 says, he crouches at the door of Cain to tempt him away. And as the seed comes, Cain and Abel, he tempts Cain away and Cain gives away to his base sin and goes and kills his brother Abel. And in one fell swoop, I think Satan thought, I've done with that promise. This, the seed has been defeated. But then Seth came. And then the next generation, the next generation. And Satan hounded every generation. That list of men was not of some glorious men with a great track record and pedigree. Many of them were fallen, broken men who were tempted away at times, where the enemy tempted them to get on the treadmill and run hard. And then they fell short and grew tired. And then he told them they fell in the heap and said, we've done too much. But then he'll tempt them and they'll get back on the treadmill and run until they got tired and said, we've done too much. Never living in abundant life like so many of us. Live between working hard and then falling short, and working hard and falling short, never getting the, 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 the abundant life that God has got for us. And he dogged their lives because he wanted to de de deal a death knell to the, the seed of Adam. And then Jesus was born, and Satan watched Jesus. And as Jesus started to do miracles, Satan ran, as the, each miracle happened, he ran to the veil in the temple, and he saw the veil was still standing. So he's like, oh, thank goodness. Then he started hearing Jesus' t sermons and, and introducing the people of this earth to the, the kingdom of God. So Satan ran and looked at the veil. Oh, it's still standing, thank goodness. And then Jesus died. And as, as, as he died, he gave his last breath and said, it is finished. All of hell erupted and said, yes, it is finished indeed. High-fiving Satan, saying, yes, they spoke. God said that the seed will crush you, but you have crushed him by the hands of those he created. Jesus is dead. It is finished. It is done. Humanity's hope is finished. But Satan wasn't as excited as other demons. This is not in the Bible. This is my imagination. But I can imagine Satan, who's watched this journey, sees Jesus die. And that day on the Friday, he picks up the phone. He dials death 666. What's your phone, death? Gets the jingle. It was Lady Gaga. Anyway, um, <laughs> Scrap that. He's listening, and then death answers. He says, hey, Satan, what can I do for you? He says, oh, listen, I know I don't do this often, but just phoning to find out, is, has Jesus, Naz Jesus of Nazareth's body arrived? And death goes, has it arrived? Of course it arrived. I'm death. I don't miss a beat. I've done this since the beginning, buddy. Relax. I've got this. He's lying in front of me, dead as a doorknob. I can see him. Jesus of Nazareth, let me check the tag. Yeah, dead. <laughs> dead, dead, dead. Thank you. Please leave me alone, Satan. I've got a job to do. Go enjoy your party. So he's like, sorry, sorry, sorry. I know maybe I'm just obsessing a bit here. She puts the phone down. Saturday morning, the party's going. Satan wakes up with stress. Oh, two and two's not adding up here. Let me phone. Six, six, six. Death answers. Yes, Satan, what? Listen, I just want to make sure. I've been watching this for a while. Is he still there? He's here, buddy. I can see him. I've not lost one yet. Please back off. Go back, 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 back. Leave me alone. Let me do my job. Satan's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. Sunday comes. Death phones Satan. <laughs> says, 
um, yes, death. After that, Satan, um, I just, just need to tell, need to tell you um, that G Jesus of Nazareth is sitting bolt upright. He's looking me in the eye, and I've never seen this look before. <laughs> and Satan starts to panic. He puts him on speakerphone and starts saying, death, you hold on to him. Death, you do not let him go. You hold that man, Jesus of Nazareth. You do not let him ascend. You hold him down there. But the problem was, death could not hold Jesus. I want to tell you, sir and ma'am, today, I want to tell my fickle heart that my confidence and my abundant life is not resting in my ability to make it happen. It's not resting in the fact, how many rights do I have to put wrong? How many confessions I need to make? How many songs I need to sing? How many church services I need to attend? How many things I need to do? My freedom and my abundant life is held in the one who holds the keys of life and death. If we know this, this will be the greatest sermon you'll ever hear. This will be the most important sermon you ever hear if you lay hold of us and move on. Can I call the band up, please, as we stand to our feet? Can everyone hear right now? Close their eyes, please. I really believe that today is a, an appointed and promised time for sons and daughters. Today is an appointed and promised time for sons and daughters. Your moment has come, sir, ma'am. I woke up this morning with my heart beating and the word saying the prodigals are going to come home today. I believe prodigals, people who have run far from God, people who have felt they are so far gone, people who have been limping for a long time are saying, today, today I'm coming home. Today I've heard this good news, and it's not about me, it's about Him. Today I'm coming home. Maybe it's for the first time, sir, ma'am, or maybe it's for the hundredth time, I don't care, but today, without sending, uh, sounding any alarm, we've got the ESCOM are turning our power off in five minutes. We know that because they've sent out an announcement about it. Sir, ma'am, you do not know when your eternal power, your life will go. You do not know when God will call your days to be done but you do have today to respond to him. Don't leave it for another day. Don't leave it for another moment. Respond to him. Come home today and experience abundant life. The enemy's voice needs to be silenced and the appointed time and the promised time has come for you to respond to him. With every head bowed, if you here today need to give your life to Jesus as a prodigal returning or for the first time, a dead man coming to life, if that is you, today is your day. Do not wait, sir, ma'am. I'm gonna to count to three. And I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand as a sign saying, I need Jesus. I need his blood to cover me and wash me clean and make me whole. If that's you, one, two, three, please lift your hand. No one else is looking except me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right now, as these hands go up, I thank you right now, God. The hands are lifted. The voice of the enemy is silenced. The voice of the accuser that says, don't be emotional. Don't put your hand up. Don't run that way. Just stay in your corner. Right now, that voice is silenced, and the voice of heaven is yelling out, well done. The voice of heaven is saying, my good and faithful servant, my voice of heaven says, this is my son and daughter whom I love and I'm well pleased. And the appointed time of heaven, the promised time of heaven is for you today, sir, ma'am. The old has gone, the new has come. The old is dead, the new has come. And I thank you, Father God, as these people with their hands up and say, Jesus, I repent by giving you my life so that I can have yours. I thank you, God, in the simplicity of that moment. Holy Spirit, come and seal and do what only you can do and make dead hearts come to life. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Why don't we lift up a shout of praise to Jesus? Come on.